All right, thank you everyone. And the uh, second lecture of today's three lectures, so this is the, the middle one, is uh, Lynn Winskill of Huawei Labs and University of Strathclyde. And I think there's also Copenhagen there on, on the slide. So, Lynn, tell us how to make concurrency functions. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to come and make sure here. Unfortunately, I had COVID last week, so I'm a little bit uh, ragged. So uh, keep me on the ball by asking questions. You seem to be very good at that, and I hope I can answer them. Um, okay, so uh, we've seen, I suppose, a couple of examples now of um, denotational semantics, which originally started as the main theory of denotational semantics, in which you um, People wanted to understand the types in programming languages of certain kinds of spaces and the programs they were writing as certain kinds of functions between those between those spaces. And because we're concerned with computable functions, uh, which can act on infinite things, but only by virtue of approximations, so those functions had to be continuous. And this gave rise to a, a, an idea of domain theory, which um, basically gave a mathematical foundation for functional programming, understanding uh, Types of certain these certain topological spaces, these domains, and uh, pro, uh, the functions you are programming as continuous continuous functions of a certain kind, um, and that gave a lot of faith to uh, people when they were developing functional languages. In a, and in a way, what's happened now is that now people have uh, have reached the heady heights of functional programming. They've thrown the ladder away to some extent and forgotten about domain theory and denotational semantics, which really ultimately gave the justification for it. Uh, of course, computer science is a very dynamic subject. The subject is changing under our feet. Um, and uh, there are various new features coming along, like probabilistic programming. And so what you're seeing in OHAD's course is really a, a kind of generalized domain theory and denotational semantics, generalized to the problems of probabilistic programming where along the way in your program, you can make random choices and you might condition in certain ways according to observations that you know uh, about the uh, thing that you're modeling. In a way, I'm doing something a bit like that. Um, I'm, taking, I'm looking at a kind of generalized domain theory in which types are understood as games and uh, programs and process or processes are understood as strategies. Uh, so I'm not so much interested in games per se, but games as a way of understanding, understanding computation. And uh, I'm talking about uh, concurrent or distributed games um, in contrast to what you may normally think of when you think of games and strategies. Uh, you might, often people think of games as essentially standing for a tree with a tree of behavior, something like this. There's a game tree where you have some start point, and then opponent might make one of two moves in this case. And then subsequent to those moves, player might make some moves and then opponent might make some moves and so on. So there's often this idea of uh, <coughs> a game, a game or a strategy as de delimiting some kind of um, uh, sequence of actions that the uh, player and opponent make. Um, I want to look at distributed games where you might imagine several games going on uh, over space in a distributed way in the manner of a distributed computation. In which case, it doesn't really make sense to think of a game as represented by a game tree like this. Imagine, for example, a game tree for one particular player of chess and a game tree for another game of chess. You would um, not nat naturally, when you represented those situations, necessarily get a tree out. You get two trees put in parallel with each other. And so what I'll be using as the model for supporting this notion of distributed, uh, distributed game is a model called event structures. And so I'm going to be introducing you to that model of event structures. And this will allow us to talk about games in which players have the form of partial orders rather than total orders of you play, I play, you play, I play, and so on. Of course, when you start moving the scenario of games to this new one, there are all kinds of issues. What is a strategy? What's a probabilistic strategy? 
Uh, it's easy to see what probabilistic strategy should, should be in a case like this. They will maybe non determinate probabilistically choose of one of these branches. But when you have something more distributed, what, what's the nature of a probabilistic strategy? Now, all of these things have been answered. You won't see much of that. But in this context uh, of generalized context of distributed games, an amazing amount of things started working, probabilistic and quantum and so on. But what I'll be doing is giving you in this first lecture uh, a background on event structures. And then so when developing this, this, uh, these games about just 10, 10, 12, 10, 10, 11 years ago with a chap called Sylvain Brito, who came over uh, as an intern for me in S Paris, uh, we found that some old stuff that I'd done in the early 80s on stable families was, uh, was a good way of working with these uh, event structures. And I'll tell you about that. That's a kind of secret tool for working with event structures that's not as widely known as I think it should be. And then in the lecture tomorrow, what I'll do is I'll try and draw these uh, facts together into a theory of games and show you how many of the paradigms that you may have met in functional programming, things like uh, lenses and optics and uh, geometry of interaction and uh, dialectic of interpretation, how these come about in a way that surprised me as just certain kinds of subcategories of games. By choosing very simple games, you specialize to these uh, old paradigms, classical paradigms, and sometimes to some new ones. So ideas like dependent optics have started coming up. And that's more of a, that's a less, uh, less clear niche. So I've got some literature that I put at, uh, at the end of this slide that for you to follow up on this. And uh, I welcome questions. So whether I'll reach my ambitions here, I don't know. Okay. Clear. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So you said the, the two player single arena game. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you said in the distributed setting, it gets complicated. Does it get more complicated than forest trees? Yes, I'll come to that shortly. Very You'll see an example nice. shortly. Yeah. Um, um, at least uh, in this uh, motivational, uh, now of course things are not working. Am I doing wrong? Focus on the slide. Focus on the slide. Yeah, please click the left button. Uh, okay. Thank you, my golly. You clever tech people. Um, okay, so what I do is I'll try and introduce um, uh, event structures gently, and I'll do them by some by something you may not know so much about, but they deserve to be widely known: petri nets. Uh, you all know about transition systems, I guess, uh, where you start out with some state and then you follow certain transitions. Um, and this is, of course, fundamental in automata theory and so on. But Petri had uh, rev the revolutionary idea. Uh, way back in the 60s, of thinking of a computation as being uh, much more local, that computation could occur locally in different parts of the world, and then these different interactions, then, then these different parts of the world can interact in certain ways. So he came up with an idea of a Petri net. And here's a very simple example of a Petri net. It's, uh, you uh, don't have a global state, you can have a notion of global state, but it's derived. So, you have these circles here, these conditions, or sometimes called places, these things here, uh, and uh, they may hold or not hold. So I've put a token, if you like, on this condition to show it holds and this condition to show it holds. So there's a global state associated with those two conditions holding. Uh, but then there's a dynamics to Petri nets, which is based on the notion of event. Uh, these are these squares here. And these events have local effects. They affect the conditions to which they're wired up. Uh, and the idea is, if you see an event like this one here, its occurrence, the driving idea of the dynamics of Petri nets, is that the occurrence of an event, like this one here, ends the holding of its three conditions. That's what these are and begins the holding of its first conditions. 
So if these two conditions held, this event could occur. It would end the holding of its preconditions, and it's new, uh, and, it, and it would begin the holding of its first condition piece. Then. All right. So given this interpretation, you can see certain things are happening. You see, for example, that this event here has got effects conditions which have nothing to do with the conditions of this event or this event. So it's kind of causally independent. You see that directly in this graphical structure. You also see that these two events are, if you like, competing or in conflict for ending the holding of this precondition here. Either one could occur, but not the other, because the ending of the, the an occurrence of an event ends the holding of precondition. So only one of these events can occur. And when it does, uh, it will begin the holding of this post condition. All right. Um, so uh, this kind of concurrency structure, this event could occur concurrently with this one here because they're not affecting, they're affecting different regions of conditions. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, what would, um, and then once uh, one of these events occurs, this, this condition holds, and if this event occurs, this condition holds, then this event can hold. Then this, this event can occur, ending the holding of preconditions and re establishing the initial market. Now, often when you see Petri nets, you see them accompanied by uh, their dynamics, accompanied by an explanation of um, called the token game, where you see tokens moving around. There's another way of explaining such a, a Petri net in terms of thinking about the occurrences that can occur. So let's think about the occurrences that could occur as this, this, get, this net goes through, goes through its uh, behavior. Initially, of course, there are just these, um, whoops. Right. Initially, we just have these two conditions holding. So we have these corresponding occurrences. But then having, then what might happen is we might have uh, this, this event occurring, or one of these two events occur. But if one of if this then this condition will occur, but it can either occur through the right or the left event. So what's going to happen is that was that occurrence will split into two according to how it was made to occur. So in keeping track of occurrences, we keep track of the ways in which they're made. These occurrences occur. So we do that, and then uh, uh, then we think then of course the preconditions of this event occur. They can occur either through this right event or this left event. So uh, there are two occurrences of this event uh, according to the way it might have occurred, and so on and so on as we unfold the behavior of this petri net. Then we get something called an occurrence net. So it's rather like when you take a transition system, you can unfold it to a tree. When you take a petri net, you can unfold it to an occurrence net. But if you look at this occurrence net, <clears throat> there's a certain redundancy in it. Uh, if you think about what the conditions are doing, they're either indicating conflict as here between these two events here or between these two events here. Or they're representing some kind of causal glue where you see that in order for this event to occur, it depends on this earlier event. So if we um, abstract away that use of conditions, just remember what they're important for, then we end up with something called an event. You just look at the events and remember what that causal glue was doing is giving us a partial order of causal dependency between the events where you see that this event depended on this one for example you see this one, don't, don't, don't see that you see that this event depends on this one uh, and you see the conflicts you see which event immediately conflicted with which which are so if we um distill out from this a mathematical definition this is the simplest definition of event structure that I can more or less get away with. So, an event structure is consists of a set of a event occurrences. 
together with a partial order of causal dependency. When you see something like this, it means that in order for E to occur, E prime has got to occur previously. And if you see conflict relation, conflict relation, the, the, partial, the causal dependency is a partial order, uh, and the conflict relation, it's going to be uh, a binary irreflexive symmetric relation on events, which is saying, if you see something like this, that one event excludes the occurrence of the other. And then there are a few, a couple of simple axioms. One is that you look at the events on which a particular event causally depends, consider that as a set, uh, we say that that's going to be a finite set by field. And we also say the causal dependency is propagated upwards. You've got two events on which two other events causally depend. Those two original events were in conflict, then the events which depend on them are in conflict too. <coughs> so here's a little picture we shall use every now and again in this uh, little mini course. Here are these events, here are the causal dependencies, and I'm representing conflict by this squiggly line here. So you see, uh, you can see uh, in such a structure, just as with, with next, you can see some concurrency uh, when events are can occur independently of each other, when they are concurrent. Namely, when they're not in conflict with each other and neither event causally depends on the other. So we see, for example, uh, that this event is in is concurrent with this one. That one, there's two events. We also see that this event causally depends on this one, which is in conflict with this one here. So if this event occurs, then that up, uh, then this event on which this one causally depends cannot occur. So this can't occur either. So these two events are in conflict. Yeah. Is it correct to say with this definition that the events will never converge? Uh in what sense? Uh, because you could you could have two events that depend. Once they conflict, no, they won't converge. That's right. If you have two events which are conflicting, that's right. Then events which depend on them have to be in conflict as well. And if you did have the kind of convergence you're thinking about, that would be like an event which depended on two conflicting events, and so it would be in self-conflict, so it wouldn't be allowed. Now there are variations on event structures which would allow that kind of thing. Uh, some French variants, trace event structures, and, and so on, by Boudal and Castellani, Castellani, and so on. But, but that's not the case here. All right. All right. Sam? Yeah. I have a, a trivial question. Good. Uh, which is why do you write the rest of that all equal to symmetry that's related to irreflexible? Well, you could have less than an event less than or equal to itself. Well, you regard it as. Oh, hash is a reflexive. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, hash is a reflexive. Yes, hash is a reflexive. That's right. Sorry. Sorry. Hash is reasonable. Hash is reasonable. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So is, is this the same as the dependency graph that you have there? Um, yeah, I'm not so good on terminology, but, but if you take, there's a way of going from a Masakiewicz trace language to an event structure, namely, you take a Masakiewicz trace language, you put your finger on uh, an element of the alphabet of interest, and then you use the independence relation to push all the things on which it doesn't really depend uh, up above it, and that gives you an event associated with that particular occurrence of the symbol. So there is a way of going, there's again an adjunction between, uh, there's, a, there's a, a junction from event structures to the category, from the category of event structures to the category of Masakiewicz trace languages. And the, and the right adjoint will be the one that makes the Masakiewicz trace language into an event structure. Now we're looking way ahead now, okay? But uh, it's kind of promising, in, in a promising direction. Yeah? I'm trying to get the question to the second condition there. What is the direction? So when you say is greater than equal to, yeah, does that mean it depends on your map or is it the other way? Um, so it's yes, if if you um, events depend on earlier things, lesser things. So uh, so that's the way to remember. So this is earlier in time, not really, but earlier, and then uh, so that's uh, so e depends on. E prime. Right. So if earlier events are a conflict, the future events are a conflict. Exactly right. That's what the action is. Well done. Yeah. Okay, good. I probably won't get to the end, will I? Never mind. Um all right. Now I'm actually having got that's the simplest event structure. If you understand that definition of event structure, that's really going to be enough. But they're not quite general enough sometimes. And I don't want to keep saying uh, um, event structures, when you generalize them a bit, you get exactly Berry's DI domains. Um, or uh, I, I want, so I want to work with slightly more general event structures than the ones you've seen. And I'm going to uh, move away from a binary conflict here. So in examples, I'll often rely on uh, binary conflicts because they're easy to draw. Um, and I did consider just using binary conflict all the way through. It's just that it makes other definitions a little bit more complicated. Now, um, here's a slight generalization. The generalization is that sometimes it can be that conflict is not binary. It might be that uh, two events, there might be three events, and any two of them can occur together, but to, all three of them can't occur together. So, so in order to cope with that, I want to move away from a binary conflict. And in fact, for historical reasons, I'll work with a complementary notion of a consistency, a little consistency pedigree. Uh, now, um, I wish I hadn't, but there are good historical reasons why it went this way uh, and work with, with consistency. But um, okay, so the most general event structures we'll be looking at here are ones where we have set of events and occurrences and a causal dependency as before, but now we have a, a, a consistency predicate, if you like, that picks out those finite subsets of events that occur together. I could have worked with a complementary notion of by picking out those finite subsets which being conflict with each other. Wish I'd done it. In my thesis I did, but for some reason this takes the take note of authority. And this consistency uh, predicate satisfies um, some obvious conditions. You may as well say that any singleton set is consistent. And if a set X is consistent, then any, any subset of it should be consistent. And then you would like consistency to be respected down to be, if a set is consistent, you'd like it down this closure to be consistent as well. So that's what this is saying. Now, if you don't understand the details of this, it doesn't really matter too much. If you've understood the first definition I gave you, that will be enough. This is just a little bit more general than it allows me in my rather fussy, in my rather fussy mind to say things that are not half truths, but truths uh, on a few points. All right, so any questions here? So that's really uh, the definition I will be working with, though, in examples, it will often be that I will work with binary conflict, and I will often draw 
pictures like this, as you've seen. And this is just to point out that we are working with something a little bit more general when we do have uh, this notion of consistency rather than binary conflict. Because here's a situation where um, any two events are consistent, but not all events together. Now, um, given this intuition I've given you about event structures, there's a notion of state or configuration associated with event structures. Namely, you're looking at a computation or phenomenon in terms of the event occurrences. So uh, a reasonable notion of state is to look at the set of events that have occurred at some stage. And given the intuitions I've explained, it's sensible that that set of events should be consistent. Any finite subset should be. Any finite subset, well, Dan, let me keep doing that. Uh, any finite subset should be consistent in a consistent predicate. And moreover, if you've seen it, if you're attentive and you've seen an event, then you will have seen all of the events on which it causally depends. So it's better be down from its close with respect to causal dependence. So that's what a configuration is. Um, so I'll draw pictures. For a configuration, an event structure looks like, well, looks like this. A configuration will look like a subset, which is such that if you've got an event in it, and that event all of the events on another end, that, also, that event will also be in there. And you'll never have. Uh, you'll never have in, any subset you choose to take as finite that will have to be in the consistency and that will have to be in the consistency function. or if we go back to that notion of conflict that we had before any two events that occur had better not be in conflict with each other all right so um so what we've got if we take all of these configurations together and order them by inclusion We've got quite an interesting structure, in fact. We've got, if we, if we look at the order, <coughs> the order of such things, we've got the empty configuration at the bottom, and then we've got these, uh, as, as events occur, we can build up bigger and bigger sets of configurations, some of which are compatible with others, and some of which aren't. Um, so you can ask, what kind of structure do you get? And in fact, these structures didn't occur immediately to us, but after a while, we realized that these structures that we were getting were exactly uh, the structures that uh, uh, a chap in France, Gérard Berry, was looking at in his kind of alternative to domain theory. You probably, if you know about domain theory, you probably know about Scott, Scott's domain theory, but there was actually a French version, or there is a French version of it, uh, which has been very influential, called stable domain theory, and that's invented by a guy called uh, uh, Gerard Berry. And um, it differs in the uh, it differs in various respects from the Scott domain theory. As I mentioned, domains were based on some notion they were a kind of topological space. They're based on some notion of approximation. That approximate notion of approximation is caught very simply in domains by an order of information. Now, if you know about Scott domain theory, you may not, but if you know about Scott domain theory, you'll know that that notion of information is actually quite subtle. Can be quite difficult to get an understanding what it is. It turns out there's a nice way of understanding it in terms of the propositions, finitary propositions you might make about a computation as it evolves. So uh, if you're talking about functions, you might say, ah, oh, uh, on input one, that gives me output two. Um, oh, and then later on, oh, on input three, it gives me output five. Uh, those bits of information can accumulate. If you're talking about non-deterministic computation, that information will be in the form of what the computation may satisfy, or what it must satisfy. And these gives you these give you things called power domains when you look at the information associated with those. So, but it's quite a subtle notion of information. The kind of information that the French domain school looks at is much simpler. It really is to do with more information 
corresponding to more events occur. It's a very temporal notion of information. You see more events occur. Okay. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that notion, that domain theory of berries will turn up again tomorrow. It's a very special, coming out of the rising from very special strategies between very special, rather silly games. <laughs> um, all right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Di, di. Uh, Berry's um, Berry had a very proceeded axiomatically in developing his domain theory, and he axiomatized these domains called di domains, which are exactly the domains of configurations of an event structure. Now, what the D stands for is distributed. So you have a notion of distributivity between a an intersection and a union on configurations. Okay. And the I means inductive. And what that meant was that there was a notion of a kind of basis in terms of finite, uh, finite or isolated elements that you may not know about. Okay. But, but uh, for these particular, the finite elements in this particular case were really finite. So it is isolated or Isolated elements of the order structure turned out to just dominate only finitely many elements. And that's what the axiom I is. So, uh, so he proceeded axiomatically and he axiomatized them in this way. And then he showed he got a Cartesian closed category and, and so on. The order wasn't the same as the Scott order of functions. It was a much more intentional one. Talked about how, com how functions computed rather than just one function giving more, more output for the same input. Um, but uh, but he got this uh, he got this notion of uh, this kind of domain theory based on this notion of information and proceed axiomatically. But you don't really need to know um, what what these axioms are precisely because you understand if you understand the configurations of an event structure, then you'll know these things. And the distributivity of sets is inherited essentially by distributivity. It gives you the distributivity uh, on these domains of configurations. And so that's really why you have a distributed uh, law holding for these configurations. <coughs> By the way, these Berry's work maybe isn't so well known, but perhaps better known is the work of Girard, which was a kind of re Jean Yves Girard, who rediscovered stable domain theory uh, uh, in the form of qualitative and coherent spaces. And these were the underlying structures on which he rediscovered a kind of decomposition, deconstruction of class of traditional classical or intuitionistic logic in terms of a more basic linear logic. So these models, uh, um, they probably seem very abstract, but they've actually underlie uh, a lot of the history uh, of discovery of very important central notions now that people take for granted, like linear type disciplines and so on. Okay, um, talking way too much. Um, all right. Um, now, James's point: trees are very special kinds of event structures. And here's an example of a uh, of a tree. Here, uh, if you think of the configurations of this, of course, there would be the empty configuration at the bottom. So there really would be a root, which is the empty configuration, and then the configurations in general will be branches as you go along. Because of the conflict, you can only go along one particular branch in a particular way. You might think of this as a particular game uh, where these are moves of the game. Now, imagine you had two games in parallel, say. Then, and now here's the other game, it looks like this, say. It's a similar thing. Now, if you were to represent games as trees, You'd be a bit stuck now. You'd have to think of some way of making a tree out of this. You'd probably shuffle them together. And indeed, Conway in his book, Numbers and Games, that's what he does. He shuffles things together to get a tree like structure uh, when he puts games in parallel in his so called sum. Now, but that's one thing you can do. But you might also um, do a little bit more. See, with event structures, you don't need to do anything. You just stick them side by side. But with event structures, you can do more as well. You might imagine a situation where you proceed so far in this game, 
uh, maybe win in this game, and then your friend wins in the other game here, and then, oh, then you get to play each other. It's a new game here. It's no longer a tree at all. But that's uh, still an event structure. So I hope that that illustrates the power of event structures in describing games and successive games that you might want to play, how you might combine games and propose games in ways that seem naturally enough, but would be quite difficult if you stuck with two. Yeah? Uh, so we have a directive case like this. Do you ever have cycles as well? Uh, not, uh, not in the event and not in configuration of the session. But, but yeah, but you see, petri nets are not so unrelated, and you can have repetitive behavior there. So that was partly to do with my point of by working with event structures which are likely, if you like, working, replacing the notion of game tree by event structures. You've got a, a, a kind of a good model which is kind of mathematically simple, but relates. By these adjunctions to other models like PetriNet. So, if you want to look at repetitive behavior and so on, look at more what's of automata theoretic notions, then you're not far away from those models too. Yeah? Well, there's, there's maybe a somewhat naive question. I, I still don't understand what extra structure you get by having this uh, conflict relation there. So, why, why couldn't I do the construction if I didn't have the conflict relation? I could have just three. Um, the conflict relation is, is telling you something quite important, though. It's telling you that if you think about, let's go back a little. Um, go back to there. Think about the configurations of this. What would you think the configurations were of this uh, of this thing? The the whole lot. So this is an event structure. What would you think the configuration? No, you misunderstood. See, look, um, well, remember, configuration has got to be down this place. Okay, so kind of, yeah, if you have this event, you better have all of the other events in it. If you have this event in, you better have this event in as well. But it's also not, it's got to be consistent. So you can't have any two conflict event, conflicting events in a common uh, in a common configuration. So you can't have, you have this event, you can't have this event, nor can you have this event. You can only have this plan. So if you think of configurations of, of this whole event structure here, it will be a, it will consist of a pair. Configuration here, a sub branch here, or maybe a whole branch, and a branch here as well. Okay. So if you take two event structures, and you put them in parallel in this kind of way, and you think about what the configurations are of the parallel composition of those two event structures, it will, it will always break down into a pair of configurations, configuration on the left and configuration on the right. And the conflict is very important for, in, in this case, choosing the branches, okay? okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, <coughs> now I mentioned a junction, some way from a junction, but what's very important uh, for a junction is to have a notion of map. Now, um, um, these um, turned out to be, these tools were invented in the uh, very early 80s, 81 in fact. Uh, they were invented in order to try to understand um, the behavior of compound processes, like parallel compositions of processes, in terms of the behaviors of their components. So you often want to understand the behavior of a parallel composition of processes by understanding it in terms of how its behavior of the, of the how, how the behavior of the parallel composition projects to behaviors in the two components. So these maps I'm going to describe to you, I have simulation maps between event structures, are really to do that. They're talking about things like projecting the behavior from a parallel composition to a component. 
or understanding in the sum of two processes represented by an event structures, how to inject the behavior of the component of the sum into the sum process, that kind of thing. So that's where they arose. And then by the magic of category theory, once you have objects and you have maps between them, if they form a category, then you start getting, and those maps as they were, were inspired by constructions that people were using. Then once you've got those maps and you've got the, uh, you've got the category, then the category gives you universal constructions. And what you find is that universal constructions associated with, with these maps are essentially can general, the right kind of generalization of what people were doing back then when they were composing processes together. Now, yesterday, uh, one of the students, one of you here mentioned, well, you know, to insertion his talk, why, why use uh, communication by shared variables? Well, I said to his answer was very reasonable because we know how to do that efficiently. But if we're trying to reason about processes in parallel, it's not, necessar not, not necessarily the case that we want all of our ways of combining processes to just be via shared variables. In fact, in Sussmik's talk, there was a synchronization operation where he took transition systems and synchronized them together on common, on common actions. So there, there was a kind of, as Jane pointed out, uh, there was a kind of, uh, he was smuggling in some kind of message passing. And in the old days, in the late 70s, early 80s, people like Robin Milner and Tony Hall were suggesting that that's the way that we should combine processes, namely by synchronizing events of processes. Then processes go along, do some stuff, and then every now and again, they synchronize. They do a hand kind of handshake. And that handshake may or may not it involved the exchange of a value and so on. Um, and uh, so these maps will give us uh, a product which will be a kind of synchronization primitive. And that synchronization primitive will be essential in composing strategies. Now, okay, so what are these bloody maps? <clears throat> um, well, the floor picture again, I always find it helpful myself. I hope I managed to do that. Um, so, what is a map of event structures? So, it's um, going to be a partial function from one event structure to another. And remember that you have a notion of configuration, which is a downward closed consistent subset of events. And that you imagine we have a configuration X of E. Yes, it uh, doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, some doesn't really matter, but uh, that's right. This, this, uh, I, I do use C infinity when it can be, it can be an infinite one. C that's just a final one, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually make any difference. Yes. Um, so what you have is the partial function, and what you can look at, you can look at its direct image, namely all of the things. Look at all of the things here, which is all of the things over in E prime, which are such that there is something over here, which gives them. But of course, there might be things that go off undefined, if you like. Yeah. So you just so what you insist on is that the, uh, the state here, configuration here, direct images to the state here. But moreover, uh, this is the bit that makes things work. Is that there's some kind of preservation of events going on too? If you have two events, you might imagine that they went to the same event here. Might be E1, what's what the base of the system? E1, and this might be E2, and it may well be you end up with FE1, you end up with E2. <clears throat> well, in that case, we insist on a kind of local injectivity. So in local in the sense is with respect to this configuration, then we insist that E1 input E2. So you can't have two distinct events in a configuration going to a common event. Okay. Um, you can have 
there are various things about this. You could have two events in conflict. They don't belong to the same configuration. They could both go. So a common event. That would be all right. Or concurrent or right or concurrent. Not concurrent. So there would be a That's right. And then these can do that because there's no configuration containing both. You have to, any configuration just going to contain one or the other. So this local injectivity is a kind of, I always have problems explaining it, but if you don't have it, it doesn't work. But it's a kind of atomicity constraint that the notion of event is preserved. Uh, if, if, you, if you didn't have this, it's like you would have two events that are trying to be the same event, but they were different, something, something odd about it. But anyhow, it's certainly very important. It's also very important in when we come to games later, where we'll have a strategy will be a map into a game. And then you don't want the strategy to be able to, for example, make two moves of the night in the strategy when there's only one move is possible in the game. So it's it's sensible. It turns out to be very sensible in that context, but it's more sensible in other contexts too. Uh, all right. Um, now it's not the case. <coughs> it's not the case that order is preserved here. You could have um, e two causally dependent on e one, and then going to that's over in E, and then going to two concurrent events over in E prime. That would be possible. You can see any configuration here is going to look like this. This, that certainly goes to configuration over here in any case. And moreover, um, you satisfy the local injectivity condition. So you're not necessarily preserving causal dependency. Yeah. Uh, you're not preserving, but are you allowed to contribute? No, but um, but you don't preserve it, but you do reflect it locally, which is, I think, more probably as close as I can get to answering your question. <laughs> um, um, well, is there an eraser here? Yeah. <laughs> Ah, it's one of these right ones, of course. <clears throat> and you um, you locally reflect causal dependency, and I'll show you what that means. And you also preserve concurrency. That's another thing that happens by, by virtue of these maps. And I think I'll show you why. Yes? So would it be a reasonable issue to use these maps to create this kind of like this uh, embodied optimized? Yes, yes, you can understand it that way. It's more with games, it's more the other way. You have constraints in the game, and you want to make sure that you meet those causal constraints in the game but have some extra constraints, like you await opponent to do something before you do something else. Um, but, but yes, it can, be under, it can be understood that way in terms of relaxing causal constraints. Um, in the way, for example, Schutzmitt was talking about Lamport's serializability condition. If you take any serialization, you, any event, event structure, countable event structure will, will have some serialization. You can certainly serialize any countable configuration. And that serialization uh, will, there'll be a map from that to the original event structure. You lose causal dependency. <coughs> All right, so I was in the business of showing that um, if you imagine, what do I say? I do actually say it here. You do have that you locally reflect causal dependency, this thing here. And I'll just, where's my show that? I'm fine stick with that. So you have that's right. So you have um E1, and I have hopefully that position. Uh E1 
e2 uh, in a configuration x and they go to a situation where you imagine you go to fe1 and fe2 which are causally related maybe i'll stop using another color that's getting a bit uh, a bit pale isn't it And he won't go there. <coughs> now, what I'm going to show is that then you must have that E1 uh, is causally below E2. In other words, E2 causally dependent. Now, why is that? Well, uh, remember um, that we preserve configurations by these things here. So we can take the configuration, which is just the downwards closure of E2. And that was written like this. And we know that that will be a configuration. And it's going to be a configuration when we, we know that that image, rather, we know its image will be a configuration which will contain, so we test that this F of E2 will contain this, it contains the image of E2, of course it does. Ah. But uh, but it but we know that that configuration that has to be a configuration so that has to be downwards closed so in other words it has to include that downwards closure has got to include F one so there has to be something in here which goes to F of E one ah but E E one goes to F of E one. And this guy also goes to F of E1. By local injectivity, this has to be equal to. This has to be equal to E1. And this set here was all the things which are below E2, causally below E2, so they have to include E1. I don't know how clear that is. Okay, good. So, so we have the Causal dependency is reflected locally. And what that means is that concurrency is preserved going from left to right. Imagine you have two events, E1 and E2, which are concurrent in E, and they go to images, they go to define images FE1 and FE2. Then we argue that they're concurrent. Well, they certainly are consistent because they're in a configuration, namely. The configuration which is the generating the image of the downwards closure of the set E1 and E2. So they're consistent. And nor can they be causally related because of this thing we've just proved. If they were causally related, if F of E1 and E F of E1 and F of E2 were causally related, then E1 and E2 would be causally related. And that's not the case because we assume they're concurrent. So concurrent events E1 and E2 go to if they go to define things fe1 and fe2 those two things are concurrent um that's probably a reasonable place to have a break let's have a look. let me just have a quick look where i am um i'll just yes i'll just mention this now and then we'll have a bit of a break <coughs> um we have a category now so we have constructions in fact uh, we have we have products categorical products uh, we have pullbacks which will be very important for composing strategies um, uh, the products will be a kind of synchronization mechanism where you take two event structures and you let them synchronize arbitrarily you don't always want to have arbitrary synchronizations so you can use equalizers to cut down on the number of synchronizations that you have and that can then give you describe your uh, synchronization primitive of choice, depending on how you choose to do the risk, how do you choose to restrict the synchronizations that are allowed. Um, however, as we'll see, it's quite difficult to do these constructions like product directly with event structures. The definition is very simple. Every event is associated with a unique causal history. 
But that very fact can be quite obstructive when we try and do uh, constructions like a product which is doing synchronization. So for that reason, we'll move to another model, which is a little bit more general and will allow events to occur uh, in different ways, in different incompatible ways. And this model will be easier to work with. We'll be able to define products and pullbacks there very directly. And because there's an adjunction from event structures into this model of stable families, so-called, we'll be able to do constructions like product, limit constructions like product over in stable families, and using the preservation properties of right adjoints, that right adjoints preserve limits, get products back in event structures. So it's kind of practical category theory, showing how to do constructions in a difficult model by using an easier model and, and working there. Now, I'll, uh, let's have five minutes break, and then, um, uh, but I can take questions before the break if you want. Okay, yep. Um, well, if you just have uh, conflict, well, that's that's not in general. Yes, not in general. Yeah. 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 So, that, that. Yeah. so locally, local sort of configuration is kind of injected. Um, and, uh, um, and remember, even there, because they have partial maps, we could lose some. We could have two different configurations built to the same image. Uh, yeah, I'd rather rather I say that relative to any configuration you have that is locally injected. Yes. So I'm struggling to get an intuition for maps for rigid and mm -hmm. So just to sort of step back to do this the mm -hmm. naive way. So if I was doing the task of coming up with maps with event structures. Or write down something like that and preserve dependency or preserve conflict. What would go wrong with that kind of execution? Like what because these conditions are very specific, right? Yeah. Like they were designed to support the constructions that people were doing and to support the idea of reasoning about the behavior of the constructed thing in terms of the components. So if you think about a sync two processes that are synchronizing together. So two, if you like, two event structures, and then they have synchronizations introduced between them. Imagine you want to understand that behavior in terms of the components. The behavior of that compound thing should compound parallel composition should project to a behavior in both components. Uh, that the, this kind of map will do that for you. It will take a configuration of the parallel composition and uh, look at how look at the the visible part as far as a component is concerned okay and moreover you won't it will be locally injected because you can't do more in a parallel composition than the components allow you to do does that make does that help at all and i have a but will we at a later point get to understand the semantics of component languages or is that you'll get a glimpse of that I don't have, I mean, and then, you know, a full, a fuller course will, will go through some historical stuff, semantics of CCS. We don't really have time for that. Yeah. But. Yes? Mm, sure. <coughs> No, oh. no, 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 just, just, um, no, uh, the rigid maps are very special maps. They turn out to be technically kind of important. You'll hardly see them, but they are technically important. But, um, and in fact, you can, uh, you can get most maps as, um, Kleisley maps associated with a basic category of rigid maps like, like pseudo monads. So they're, they're kind of there, but, um, but you won't, you won't see that at all. Yeah. The main point here is really the second point. Yeah. The, main, the main point is that you're not getting, you might think, 
as you would say, you know, you write down something using your mathematical notes, you know, not without thinking at all, uh, that you, you maybe think preserve causal dependence. Uh, but it turns out for the task at hand, which is understanding processes and uh, the behavior of combined processes in terms of components, that's not the right thing to do. But you get something that's sensible nevertheless. You get concurrency being preserved, and you get um, causal dependency being reflected in this local sense. So, and it's the kind of thing you'd expect. If you if you have strategies will be certain kinds of maps into games. The games will enforce certain causal dependencies. You can't make this move before making this one, this kind of thing. That will have to be obeyed in the strategy. So that's fine. So the local reflection is exactly the kind of thing that you kind of thing that you want. Yeah, that, that's an idea. There's an idea there. Normally you don't think of strategies like that. You think of a, a, a game as a tree. You think of a, a strategy as uh, perhaps being a choice of moves you might make particular places. But you could equivalently maybe think of it as a subtree, picking out for each, uh, bra each branching of this kind, it would, uh, an opponent can do anything, but then I choose to go left here, and so on, that kind of thing. So, so then you pick out a subtree. So you're not getting that far away from a subtree being a kind of map. Into, into a tree. So we're not that far away. But event structures, there's much more room. So we maps are important uh, with event structures in ways that they're not important when you're in the simple world of games as trees. Can you speak up a little, sorry, a little bit? Uh, <clears throat> Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, can you not have like a sense of structure, time space? Yes, yes, but but it turns out with Scott domain theory, you can't make that work fit with the Cartesian closed structure. The function spaces quickly detach from this temporal way of understanding. Okay, uh, If you know anything about the Scott order on functions from in, the, in a function type, then it's got nothing to do with time. Um, so you, you would quickly lose that. Now, in fact, and in fact, this is the reason why I got into this stuff way back in the late 70s, mid 70s. Uh, was because I was more interested in time complexity of programs and interested in time complexity of programs at higher time. And the traditional domain theory was not good at that because it was detaching, it, the order detached away from the temporal behavior too much. And so, so around this time, so that's, that's what really led me, to, led me to event structures and so on. Um, there are combinations. There are things called bi-structures and bi-domains. Bi-domains invented by Gerard Belli in his taste et tap. And uh, that, um, there he does try and combine both structures together. And um, we, we hope for a while to solve the full abstraction problem that kind of way in the late 70s and early, early 80s, but it uh, wasn't to be, of course. That was great for five minutes, sir. Uh, yes, let's do that. <laughs> All right, so uh, maps of event structures and then uh, categorical constructions, but they're not always so easy. And I'll, um, I was going to do this laboriously on the board, um, but I don't think I've got so much time. So, um, so I, I guess you may or may not know what a categorical product is, but um, once you've got a category, here's what a categorical product is of A and B. It consists of an object called A times B, together with two projection maps, 
I1 and I2, which have a universal property that if any other guy that looks of the same shape, there exists a unique map here which makes these two triangles here unique. Well, unfortunately, I think we've got a very tangled thing there. <laughs> Sorry, yes, that happened back. Yeah. They, they wear out so much. Ah, uh, yes. So, categorical product consists of an object and projections into the two things that exist, right? May not exist, but if it does exist, it's got this universal characterization. But given anything, any other candidate for product, something that's got candidates for projections, F1 and F2, but somehow the product is the best guy in the sense that there exists a unique mediating map H, mediating in the sense that what it will do is make these two, uh, these two triangles here unique, in the sense that during this composition, the same as this, and this composition is the same as that. Now, turns out that um, event structures with these maps I've described does have a categorical product. The maps were devised in order to understand constructions like Milner's and so on as, as um, in, in, in terms of their subcomponents. But then what happened is one noticed that the, the, once you had a category that there really was, there, there were universal constructions, uh, which were somehow more general than the ones that Milner and Hall were making. And so one could build some kind of meta language, which included um, their uh, constructions of special case. And that's the case here. What we'll have is when we look at event structures, we have two event structures A and B, and we look at their product, <coughs> it will be a kind of synchronization between these two event structures A and B. It will be as if A and B proceed, possibly independently, but then every now and again, they can synchronize and they can synchronize arbitrarily. Any event of A can synchronize with any event of B. Now, um, um, those, these constructions are not so easy to derive. And there are whole papers, uh, which are kind of slightly annoyingly said, we don't like Winskill's categorical way of doing it. We'll do it by inductive definitions. Uh, by some Dutch guys that I quite like, actually, but uh, I think it's a very misguided paper because really inductive definitions don't inform you terribly well about what's really going on. Um, so, um, uh, but just to show you the difficulties before we move to a model which does inform us about how to do the constructions, let's just look at a simple example. And the simple example is one where we're considering the product of this event structure here, B causally dependent on A and a single event structure, the sim simple event structure consisting of a single event C. Now, mm, remember our maps are partial functions. And they're on these sets. So if we think about what the events should be, at least the first guess would be they shouldn't just be pairs of events. They should be um, elements of the product of sets with partial functions. I don't know if you know what that's like, but it's, um, if you think about sets with partial functions, then um, what can happen, of course, is you could have some element C here that might go to some element A here, uh, but go to, I'll use undefined star for undefined here. Oh, well, let me make some, some it, might, it might go to something B. Ah, in which case, clearly, to, to, to be able to, to be able to represent that in here, we better have something that looks like A. Because we want to send C to somewhere, and it naturally gets sent to A to B, which will then project down to A on this side and B on this side. That's our current. But imagine that it wasn't like that. Imagine we went undefined. 
Then we want to take C to somewhere. We don't want to take it to a particular, we want to take C to something that looks like A on the left, but we don't want to make a particular choice about where it should go on the right, it should just go to undefined. So we better have elements like this, A paired with undefined here. And similarly, we thought of something, where a situation where C went to B on the right hand side and went to undefined on the left, we'd need events like this too. And that's, that's pairs of this kind, where we have A, B, and together with A star and star B, that's what the product of sets with partial functions looks like, with the projection being the partial functions now projecting to one component or the other. So, and we have a way of understanding those pairs in this context. We're thinking, thinking of the A's and B's as events. So if we see something like A paired with B, it's natural to think of that as a synchronization between the event A and the event B. And if we see A paired with star, it's natural to think of that as the uh, unsynchronized occurrence of A. It doesn't synchronize with anything, it just occurs by itself. And I remember for me at the time discovering this, it was a kind of aha moment for me to realize that we were getting uh, synchronizations by virtue of working, uh, working with partial functions. <coughs> now, um, all right. So, um, so here I'm, I'm laboring this maybe too much. So, so what is the, so given what I've said, what is this product? Well, I'm not, this is not proof that it's a product, it's a kind of heuristic explanation why it's the right thing. Well, you want to be able to allow the A and B's, A B to occur just by itself. That's this part here. You want to allow C to occur just by itself unsynchronized. But you also want to allow a situation where A and C might synchronize. That's this event here. Yeah? The meaning of stars. No, it's not like bottom. It's like definitely undefined. It's see what when you think about synchronizing processes, they're either synchronizing. If you put two synchronizing processes together, they can either synchronize together or they can synchronize with something in the environment. If you like, you can think of the star as being the unknown thing in the environment that they synchronize with. Yeah, yeah. They might synchronize with something outside. Um, <laughs> but it's not the same as the bottom element in domain theory, which, which can kind of, in a sense, it, it, it might, it might, it, it, you know, it, it stands for some part of the, the world that you don't know yet. Maybe the path ended in the event process, the other process. Uh, I'm not sure I want to follow the, that chain of intuition too much. It's, it's yours, your intuition, not mine. But, uh, <laughs> so I don't want to say yes. I don't want to say no either. <laughs> I'm all for people discovering their own way. But I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry. When you say Yeah. Yes, it was. It was natural enough in parallel compositions to have partial functions because not everything in the parallel composition would necessarily appear in the component. So that was partial, that made partial functions sensible. So then, so the definition I wrote down was reasonable. But then um, it was an aha moment to realize that then in the universal construction, because the underlying maps were partial functions, that I was going to be building events out of the product in sets with partial functions. So in the category of sets with partial functions. And that has these, uh, and as I've tried to indicate, that has these three kinds of events, the traditional pairs, but then these pairs with the dummy, with the star. 
Um, categorical product. Yeah, so I think Cartesian is overused here, but, but um, categorical product. If you look at the category, if you look at this diagram where everything is partial functions, you'll find that, you know, you, you, you have to have these guys in in order to be able to have there exists some H. That's right. If you change your category and you work with total maps, you get a different product. Yeah, that's right. It means conflict, oh, okay. conflict. And I will be using these event structures whenever I can get away with it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, only time Sorry, it's with the mass, it's hard to hear. So, only time mm -hmm. kind of put on them. No, uh, I, I said I, I think it's uh, I think it's unhelpful to think of it as a bottom element. I think it's more helpful to think of it as a occurring uh, unsynchronized with anything in, the, in in anything in the other components. So why is there now from a undefined to b c? Because um, because yeah, we're jumping right. And I think it's quite right to right, jump in ahead. So what can happen? Is in this product you can have a synchronization between B and C. A can occur unsynchronized. So just imagine a situation where you know uh, so this process goes does A and then does B, and this other process does C. And this guy does an A, and then together they synchronize. The B and the C synchronize with that. That's what that represents there. Uh, which one? Sorry, where I put it uh, that one, uh, where are I? Oh, right. uh, well, that, that one there. Uh, that's right. That one there. So that would correspond to um, this going ahead, not synchronizing here, but these two guys synchronizing together. That would give us this. This possibility. Yes, or that? If I look at the big star on the top left, mm -hmm. it should be a star C that is in the big Or the upper or the star C? Um, oh, oh, you see, yeah, and the reason why there have to be these conflicts yeah, here is remember, we can't, we have to have local injectivity. So these two guys are projecting down to an age. Actually, no, it is, it can't be the upper age and the star, the seed will happen. How do they get that? It's not in the middle. No, because there's this part, yeah, concurrent with this part. Well, it can't be this one. Well, no, it is no. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah. There's this part. Yeah, yeah. So, and, so you have a copy yeah. of this guy, this guy, you get a parallel of this kind of here, and here. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. So, why are the two E stars separate? Yeah. That's a good question. Now, uh, so these labels here, so that the points on the the points of the events, if you, if you like, there should be a dot here. That's the event. But I'm labeling by where they go to in the components. Okay. So there are. <coughs> I'm just thinking first of all, well, first of all, intuitively, there are two ways in which you can get B occurring unsynchronized. It can either occur through after A occurring and synchronized, or it can occur after A and C synchronized. So we have B occurring unsynchronized after A occurring unsynchronized, or we have B occurring unsynchronized after A and C synchronized together. Now, this is what makes the construction difficult because. We can't say these are the same event because they would then be dependent on two conflicting things. We have to split them according to the history. So this is B occurring unsynchronized after this guy. This is B occurring unsynchronized after this guy. It's exactly this kind of palaver that can lead you to a messy inductive definition if you're Dutch and you live with them. Early, early That's right. But, 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 they, but they didn't like category theory, so they're trying to. And, uh, and I, I think that was a mistake. But, um, so, we'll, so, so this is that's a kind of so that's making this construction quite difficult. Right? 
So I, I want to move the model where it's not. Yeah. Okay. Going back to Owen's point, I think that I was confused in the same way as you. Um, and you see that V star is consistent with VC. And VC is consistent with star P going down, right? Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't mean that V star is consistent with star. No, no, that is uh, that's right. Okay. Although the right hand side V star is conflicted with star P through the inheritance. Through the downward quotient, right? It's the left hand side. No, 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 that's my point. There's no quotient between A star and star C. There's no quotient. No, uh, so there's two B parts. The right hand side is consistent with star C, the left hand side is not. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the top left B star is not. Uh, yes. Yeah. One of them is to the other way. Yes. There's a, yeah. Um, and I suppose the, the bottom line is that conflict, conflict relation is not a circle, not a symmetry. Um, in fact, this story no, is not in terms of It's asymmetric. <laughs> asymmetric. Yeah? Sure. So I lost what you were saying just the last um, couple of couple of bits. What could, could you do it so that you could have explicit significance? As in, um, like let's say you had A, B, I with B on its own. Um, B is an event that can occur on a separate uh, trace. Yeah, but the, the separate traces are caught here. B, you know, B can occur. After A and synchronize, or B can occur after A synchronize with C. Those are the two different ways. Yeah, what, what I mean is like uh, C, C is the non related because it's just a separate symbol, so it's a non related event. Uh, what if instead of C you had B? Well, it's cool that. Uh, you, if, you, if, if you, yeah. Would that be like locking? I'm kind of wondering why it's called like locking. Um, when you, when you it, it may be that you're looking for the wrong construction. I mean, Ohad said something that might be helpful, which is that this is the product construction when things are kind of not related to each other. But you could imagine a pullback construction where you know that they share yeah. some common subsystem. Then it would be a pullback. You like, like this, but with a, a little bit extra in the diagram. You know that A and C share some common, A and B share some common part. And that, that's important. It's important when you combine processes which share some common interface. And that will be important when we come to synchronize strategies. Okay. Yeah. Um, together. Um, I think I've been way over. Yeah? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a bit confused by my Jesus remark that the, B, the right hand side B star is completely with star C. Uh, then the there was an axiom on these simple event structures with conflict that said if you had two events which were in conflict, okay. and then you had two events that conflicted with. And so, which calls those dependent on them, and of course, one of them might be the same event. Then, then they have to be in conflict. So that's why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quite likely, I guess, I don't care about um, when, when there isn't any sharing. Quite likely, one of the most um, you should care about is uh, Yeah. Well, I think Swiss Map was doing it yesterday. Really. I mean, you, you know, you you you. You, you want to sometimes take two processes which are independent, but for the fact that they synchronize. Um, so yes. you don't you don't always want to make sure that you don't that they may just be independent processes, apart from the fact that they synchronize. Yeah, yeah, that can happen. Yeah, you know. 
people that meet. Yeah. But there's a lot of meet somebody and shake their hands. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, so you're, you're using the word synchronize. These two things happen at the same time. It's not going to go sort of an actual interaction. I do mean it in terms of an actual interaction. Right. These pairs, A and B, A, B, that's a, synch that's a new event. A, a, C is a new event. Right. That really is a synchronization event. So in CCS, it would be a tau event. Yeah. yeah, but it's different to sort of say that some sort of active communication happens. I think when you hear that, you know, there's nothing about communication, it's just about happening together and synchronizing it. Yeah. Well, truly confirming. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so it's a way of, so this is a way of joining systems together. And by joining them together at events, so it's going to be useful. Uh, I, when do I, when do I have till? I mean, because I really don't have that much. Wait. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Okay. Uh, I don't know what I can do in ten more minutes. But let's have a look. Um, uh, there's one thing I I can get out of the way, which is useful. There's um uh, a useful operation of hiding. You sometimes want to hide part of the system, make it invisible. Uh, and that's done, uh, that will be done when we compose strategies. We won't just be talking about strategies going, um, strategies in a game, we'll be talking about strategies going from a game A to a game B. How we do that, we'll talk about next time. Uh, and we have a strategy going from a game A to a game B, and another strategy going from a game B to a game C. And we we'll want to compose those strategies and get a strategy over the game, going from the game A to the game C. So we'll want to hide the interactions or synchronizations of those strategies over B. And for that, we'll use this hiding, uh, hiding operation. And I think I'll draw it in a picture. Um, we've, got, we've got this partial function going from E to E. And um, so it's a partial function, of course. So we have the set of events E looking like this, and we have the set of events E prime here. And some of the events in E go off to undefined, and some of them go off to events in E prime. So there's a domain of definition of a partial function, namely the events that go somewhere. And let's call that V, as has been done here. So what we can do is we can um, take this map and factor it into a projection to the defined part followed by a total mass. So what do we do to get the to get that factorization? We first of all do something I've written as e down b, e projected to b. So what that is is just you take this domain of definition the events and you restrict all of the structure of the event structure to that to that set. Okay? You take uh, Causal dependency here between two events in V, it can only if they were causally dependent in, uh, in E. And you take them to be in conflict, let's use conflict version. If you take them to be in conflict in V, then only if they were in conflict in E. Okay. So you just restrict to the mathematical restriction of all of the uh, relations of event structures to V. And that, that, uh, so that gives you this event structure here. And there's clearly a map, partial map to that, namely the one that takes any event outside the domain of definition to undefined and just takes any event inside the domain of definition to itself. Uh, having done that, once you're inside this domain of definition, then of course F takes over and tells you where to go. And it's called, and we call that, so F looks like this, partial map, and then it factors into a 
partial projection and a total map, which is what's, uh, what uh, F wants to do on that domain definition. So that's a, a factorization property. It even has a universal um, characterization, namely here, it's the kind of best way of doing it, but you don't really need to know that. It's a way of doing highly. That notion, notion of projection to the defined part will be very useful for hiding the junk that we don't, we want to put into the background. We want to regard it as somehow internal to the computation. For those of you who know about CCS, it's doing hiding differently than CCS does it. CCS does it by having these tau events, which are then abstracted away with, through, through your choice of equivalents. This is doing it much more fundamentally on the model itself. Uh, it's, in, it's important for hiding. Um, and um, I don't really have time to, uh, to do what I wanted to do, really. But I'd better do it next time and then hopefully can get you um, started, at least, on uh, games and strategies. Um, but I'll save stable families this super-duper secret weapon for reasoning about event structures. Uh, I'll leave that till, till later. It's getting close to lunch. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lynn. And uh, it's one time. I'll just spend the other time. Thank you.